Good morning, everybody. It is Sunday in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My name is Adam Bittner, digital sports producer for the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, joined today by Andrew Destin to do a preview of NF, uh, Penn State players uh, in the NFL draft and, and their prospects of getting selected um, to, to go to the next level after some distinguished college careers. Andrew, how are you? Doing well, Adam. Always up for uh, chatting about the Nittany Lions with you. Looking forward to it. Yes, Andrew was our Penn State beat reporter last season for the Post-Gazette. He's since graduated to Penguins and Pirates coverage, so check him out there. But there's no one at the paper that knows these Nittany Lions better than him, so we figured we'd bring him in uh, for a special guest appearance on the uh, College Talk um, to, to just kind of get a feel for, for where these guys might have their best fits, where they might go in the draft, and, and what Andrew's expectations are for them. We're going to start with Joey Porter Jr. He's obviously the big name. Um, has a lot of ties to the Steelers. I, that's why he's been at the top of a lot of Steelers fans lists all off season. His dad played for them. He coached for them. Um, he obviously grew up in, partially in, in the Pittsburgh area, went to North Allegheny and then went on to Penn state. So there's just lots of ties there. Andrew, is this one of those situations where that is the most obvious fit for him just because of all those ties? Or are there any other teams that you're looking at that, that might be a good fit for his skill set? Yeah, I think it's a natural great fit, right, for the Steelers. You mentioned the legacy there with his father. Um, you mentioned the local ties and being a Penn State guy, but also the need for the Steelers, right? This isn't just a, oh, well, you know, this would be nice, a late-round flyer. This makes sense. He's a legitimate first-round talent, especially with Sutton departing, them not being able to re-sign him. Um, you know, I, the Patrick Peterson signing, you know, obviously the, the hit there, they're probably pegging him to be a safety long-term any reps he's going to get at corner, it's not like it's going to be an every down type of thing. They're going to need somebody to fill uh, one of those cornerback spots. And Joey Porter Jr. makes a ton of sense. A uh, rangy, athletic guy who showed that despite having really long arms, which is a blessing in his case, don't get it wrong. But in 2021, he was prone to lots of pass interference calls. He would get a little bit too handsy. In 22, during the handful of games that he was able to play before an appendicitis, um, you know, he showed the ability to be a shutdown corner that teams did not want to throw to. And when they did, he was not going to get called for the pass interference calls. I think there was one against Purdue. And other than that, it was maybe just a few more. Uh, just really turned in a fantastic year in a lot of ways. Has that athletic ability. Fits in really well with the Steelers. But another name that I've seen him be linked to is the Detroit Lions. I mean, they've moved on from Jeff Okuda, traded him off to the Atlanta Falcons. He was somebody they thought really highly of, drafting him really high and have kind of moved on saying that that didn't really work. Um, and, and the Lions drafting in a similar spot around there to the Steelers. They're another team that I think makes sense in that mid-first round range uh, for Joey Porter Jr., especially the scheme and what the Lions want to do with aggressive cornerbacks, and Porter Jr. fits that bill. It could be a Nittany Lion and then just just drop the Nittany and become a Lion. That'd be pretty interesting. Um, if, if Not that we haven't seen other Penn State guys do that in the recent past. Andrew, I think the big critique a lot of Steelers fans have of Joey Porter Jr.'s game is that he – wasn't a huge playmaker at Penn State. He wasn't a guy who was um, generating a lot of turnovers, wasn't a guy who who was, was someone you necessarily noticed all the time if you were watching this Penn State defense. Um, is that a fair critique that he was not a phenomenal uh, playmaker, or was that more a tribute to, you know, he, he just wasn't making a ton of plays because he was shutting down his half of the field? Yeah, it's definitely the latter. It, it's like, you know, the common adage, you don't notice a left tackle unless they get blown up and they sack the quarterback. You don't notice a long snapper unless it's a bad snap. You, you know, I could go on and on with all these. You don't notice a bad defensive catcher in baseball unless they're letting a bunch of pass balls. That was the case with Joey Porter Jr. I mean, you go back, put on the film from the Purdue game against an air raid offense, to put it simply. Aiden O'Connell, Charlie Jones. I mean, they were throwing 50, 60 passes in that game. And they attacked Joey Porter Jr., and he rose to the occasion. I think 10 passes were sent his way, and three were for completions. Maybe one pass interference call, but he defended six passes. It's like some astronomical number. And pretty much from that point on in the season, the team said, well, let's try this Kalen King guy. Uh, we know what Joey Porter Jr. is going to do. He's going to shut it down. So maybe the stats aren't there, but you know, uh, you know, know, there's only so many Darrell Revises, right? The guys who can really be a shutdown corner and still generate a five to seven interception season. That's so rare. Um, but wouldn't you rather have the guy who doesn't let up any passes, doesn't let up the big chunk plays, and maybe has just a handful of interceptions in a season? He'll definitely get challenged at the next level. There's no question. So that makes him a little bit harder to gauge. But, you know, I, I think you put on that Purdue tape, that should tell you all you need to know in terms of uh, what kind of a player and 
what to expect from Porter Jr. when there is that high volume of passes sent his way. Last thing on Joey Porter Jr., um, how do you stack him up with those top corners? Devin Witherspoon, Christian Gonzalez are, are I think, the top two names that, that he's compared to. But there's also guys like Deontay Banks, who you saw in the Big Ten. Um, where, where would you put him? Is he in kind of the – I've kind of been saying I think he's kind of the 1B guy and Christian Gonzalez and uh, Devin Witherspoon are the 1A guys. And then the, after Joey Porter Jr., then there's a market drop. Is, is that kind of how you see his his stock as well? Yeah, I kind of see it that way, just because, like I mentioned there with the intangibles, for as much as it is a blessing that he does have those long arms and it makes it so he can recover even when he's beaten in coverage, things like that, the reality is that in the NFL, I mean, that's something that for as good as it is, it's a easier way for referees to throw a flag because you're just so much more prone to contact, so much more prone to being handsy. And NFL receivers, no disrespect to any of the Big Ten teams, they're a little bit different than uh, when you're going up against Northwestern on a rainy Saturday afternoon in October. You know, you're going to be facing guys who are better athletes, guys who can climb the ladder on you. And Joey could kind of get away with being the bigger guy in most instances when you think about it in a lot of these matchups. I mean, coming in at 6'2", 200 pounds with those really long arms, there were times where, quite frankly, he could get away without out-physicating receivers. Um, you know, I would be hard to press to believe that that's going to be a case every Sunday in the NFL. So that's the only reason that I would bring him down a couple of notches is because we've seen him be reliant on the physical tools, which, while great, um, it brings into question the the skill, the technique, all those sorts of things that I think uh, the top two guys definitely possess. Another prospect from Penn State on Steelers fans' radar because of another need in the secondary is safety Jair Brown. He is, I think, listed somewhere in the hundred, ranked somewhere in the hundreds, uh, high hundreds in terms of, well, I guess it depends upon how you classify high hundreds. I'm talking about in the 190 overall range, uh, but just because safety is a, it's a tough spot to, to take high in a draft. It, it's, it's usually one of the lower priorities for most front offices. All the same, Jair Brown is one of the best safeties in this class. How do you see, I guess, first of all, the fit with the Steelers? Um, and second of all, his stock, generally speaking, is is he possibly a day two guy? Or is this, um, you know, a, a day three type of situation just because of the nature of his position? Yeah, I think the fit with the Steelers, it's probably not of the utmost priority. Uh, I mean, sure, you got a couple of guys. You signed Peterson. You got Fitzpatrick back there. You probably are set in that regard that you don't need to reach for a safety who, in my opinion, as much as I love Brown's game at the collegiate level, there are some very legitimate questions about how that transfers to the NFL. Number one, speed. I mean, he, he's a great tackler in open space. He's a ball hawk. He's got good instincts. But the speed, you know, there, there's some there's some things that you just can't coach. And as much as he works at it and he's got as good of a work ethic as anybody, that's something that will show up on Sunday. So I really – I question his game translating to the next level. And for that reason, one, I don't know that he would be worth, uh, you know, a day two pick by the Steelers on. And two, I don't know if he's worth a day two pick by any team. I think there's a good shot he could slide a little bit. It's not the most stacked safety class, no question about it, which is why, to your point, he is one of the better prospects in the class. But if you don't have to reach, which the Steelers really don't have to, it feels like, um, why, why do it? You know, and, and for that reason, I think, He's probably somebody who's not going to be keen on their radar, but would be also be more of a day three guy uh, for some of these other franchises. Let's fast forward to day three, Andrew. Let's let's say, okay, he's still on the board. Um, what does he do well, and what, what would make him an asset maybe in that range? Um, obviously, the speed's the limitation, but what are the things that he does well that, that a team might really say, hey, this is worth a fourth, fifth, sixth round pick for us? Well, he's a smart player first and foremost. I mean, he's not somebody who's going to get – blown up in coverage you're not going to beat him over the top um he's going to let the play work out in front of him and he'll you know something he got away with in college which i'm curious how that would translate to the nfl is um you know really baiting quarterbacks uh his ability to track back across the field if it's a 40 yard bomb down the sideline you know his ball skills for as much as fans maybe want to critique porter jr for his lack of playmaking ability um there's no question that exists for brown um, his tackling ability, his ability to create fumbles too. I mean, he is a forced fumble guy, <laughs> to say the least. Oh, very much uh, somebody who's willing to tackle. So he's somebody that I think, if you look at how you project him out into the NFL, could be maybe somebody that you kind of put into that hybrid role between linebacker and safety. 
um, you know, the field backer or whatever you want to call it based on uh, different schemes, but uh, could be kind of one of those tweeners, um, but he's also not the biggest guy. So, you know, I think it really just comes down to whatever team could best use his skill set and whichever team isn't in a traditional down defense, whichever one likes to mix it up with junk packages. He's somebody that could excel in that kind of a format. Um, and as well as, you know, being somebody who's willing to tackle, has those abilities and certainly generated turnovers. I mean, you go back to 2021 tied for the nation lead in interceptions. And there's a reason that number went down last year. It's because teams didn't throw in his direction as much. They really, one side of the field was Porter Jr. and Jair Brown. Teams were like, we're going to go after Kalen King and whatever safety Penn State puts out there on the opposite side. Uh, another fringe, I think, day two, day three pick is Parker Washington, the wide receiver. Um, had a great career at Penn State. It, it's fast. I, I think he's really good at separation. Uh, but as the list I'm looking at by NFL Draft Buzz has him at number 130 overall. Um, so that's obviously in, more probably in the day three range. Is there any chance he could slip into day two, or is this just a matter of his size is a limitation that NFL, you know a lot of NFL teams are going to hesitate using a premium pick on? Yeah, and not just the size. I mean, coming off the injury. I mean, he had a season-ending injury at the end of the campaign. He's still working back to full health. I don't believe, to my knowledge, that he's operating at full capacity yet. I know not a full participant at Penn State's Pro Day, uh, you know, combine things like that. Um, so for me, I would be shocked to see him go day two. Um, you know, of course, let alone day one. It goes without saying. But with Parker, I think um, he would be a great late round flyer on a team. The question is just how late are they willing to take the flyer on him? I, I would say the fourth round is probably the right call for him. Maybe he could drop down to the fifth, but I'd be surprised to see him go lower than that. Just because even though he does have those physical limitations, not being the tallest guy, um, he wins contested ca uh, battles more often than not. His hands are glue. It's in the same stratosphere as a Jahan Dotson when coming out of the draft. Um, you know, you and I have talked about this before. Receivers who had better stocks coming out of Penn State because of maybe errant passes from Sean Clifford that trained them to be better at catching uh, passes outside of their normal catch radius. Parker Washington falls under that category as well. His ability to catch passes over the middle, his route running is tremendous. His, uh, his quickness and his ability to play as a slot receiver I mean, you want to talk about a day one fill him in right now, receiver number three in any offense in the NFL. He could be that. Uh, whether or not he's a starter, that's you know dependent on the franchise, dependent on the organization. But he fits exactly what a lot of teams are looking for as that number three guy. So it kind of comes down to how do you value that? How big of a priority is that for different teams? So um, to me, day three, definitely a round four guy, maybe round five. Does he have KJ Hamler upside though? Um, yeah, I, I think he's probably a little bit slower than KJ Hamler was. Um, you know, but but I think they all they both kind of evoke memories of each other in, in different ways. Could he play up to being? Is that his upside in the NFL? Is being kind of a KJ Hamler type um, for some of these teams? Where no, he's not going to be the backbone of an offense, but um, like you said, he's going to have a reliable role um, pretty much on on most NFL rosters. I think he could actually um, exceed what KJ Hamler has done for the Denver Broncos, to be quite honest. I think the physicality, yes, he is slower, which maybe led to the less production than Hamler had in the uh, back in college. But we've seen it at the NFL level. I mean, Hamler has been hampered by injuries. Um, he's not the most physical guy. So operating out of the slot, he has that quickness, but creating separation. And albeit the numbers are lower because Denver Broncos. Um, but uh, to Parker's point, He's got that physicality. He's a bigger build, bigger body, about the same height. Um, I think his ability to create space in the slot, and not just that, he has a real feel for it. And that's not to you know put, uh, put down Hamler, but Parker really has an idea of how to sit in the middle of zone coverage, how to come off the line really quickly and create separation just for that instantaneous eight-yard eight pickup. Um, and not to mention, he's got the superior skill to Hamler in terms of being able to go up uh, you know, win a 50-50 ball. He's not the biggest guy, but if you put him up against somebody who's of a similar stature or maybe just a couple inches bigger, I mean, you put on the tape, go back to the Penn State-Minnesota game, the whiteout, he caught a 50-50 ball in the end zone that I didn't know Washington was capable of. So I, I think the sky is the limit in terms of him as a slot receiver. It's probably not much more than that, but I wouldn't be surprised to see him outperform Hamler in the NFL. I think the next biggest name that there's some question about Andrew is Sean Clifford, Penn State's six-year quarterback, uh, controversial at times on this on this YouTube channel, especially. 
uh, because you know he's he's never been the most skilled guy. He's never been the most productive guy, the most accurate guy. But I think there's there's a lot of attention on those like late rounds of the draft this year because of because of what Brock Purdy did in in San Francisco. Um, you know, he's a veteran quarterback who knows the game. Um, is there any chance in your mind that Sean Clifford gets a team to to take a flyer on him in that range? Um, and and you know, I'm not going to say I think he can be Brock Purdy, but is 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 that kind of the best case scenario for him? And how possible is that? I think it's such a good question because I think it really comes down to the team. Um, and we've seen franchises like the San Francisco 49ers who value players like that, like a Brock Purdy, who have that leadership, that experience, because they're required to have that to be able to run an offense. And, you know, you ask anybody around the Penn State community, you ask anybody uh, around the college football community, and they'll tell you that Sean Clifford's ability to manage an offense, you know, read the defense at the line of scrimmage, key traits that you need in the NFL, um, he's second to none in that regard. So if he gets himself um, a late round flyer, it truly would be just be based on his game day preparation, um, his preparation throughout the week and all those sorts of things. You mentioned the intangibles. Um, you know, he's not the quickest guy, but he's somewhat fast. The accuracy is not quite there. Um, the deep ball certainly not quite there, especially at the NFL level. I would be pretty surprised to see him get drafted, but I would be surprised if he isn't signed by any team in some capacity. I think he's going to get a shot somewhere. He'll get a chance and very well may latch on as a taxi squad, practice squad type of quarterback who maybe has an outside shot at being the number three guy on a roster. Um, but if he does get picked, yeah, best case scenario is probably seventh round a la Brock Purdy. Some team saying, hey, we need somebody who can run our offense, fits that mold. Kind of like the way that Trace McSorley fit the offense with Arizona Cardinals for a few years. It wasn't because McSorley was viewed as this great NFL prospect, but because his skill set was of the mold of a Kyler Murray, maybe Clifford could fit that somewhere where that's really valued. You know, maybe it is quite frankly where McSorley is now with the Patriots. It could be a New England just to throw a name out there somewhere where maybe you don't need the on-field skills when the offense itself, the scheme itself, is what's so important, and it's just about delivering the eight-yard out route. Yeah, I, I think we've and we've seen Penn State quarterbacks have the ability to hang in the NFL these days, right? We, you think back to Matt McGloin who. Yeah. As a former walk-on, you never expected him, but but he was a, a reliable backup, made a lot of money. I think Trace McSorley's made less money, but he's found ways to stay in the league despite being small and 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 compared to most NFL quarterbacks. If, if I if I said to you, I think Sean Clifford could be starting an NFL game in an emergency capacity. Um, how much would it shock you compared to those two guys? You know, what's your perception of him now compared to where those guys were at this stage of the process? Definitely behind McSorley. Um, the reason I will put him behind McGloin, too, and it's not by much. It's really not by much. The difference there is that, yes, Clifford has the ability to read a defense and is very smart at the line of scrimmage, but McGloin really had a big benefit there. Bill O'Brien was running that offense. They were running a true, true pro-style offense every single down, the two tight end set, smash mouth football, audibles at line of scrimmage, way more to the degree than Clifford did. McGloin was just more prepared. And McGloin was accurate on those out routes, on the 12-yard out routes. He never missed on those. Catch him on a 30-yard bomb, different question. But he was very consistent within his limitations. The difference is, and this is why I think it would be a little bit more difficult with Clifford, is because of the inconsistencies that do create more highlight real plays. I mean, he had some great passes. I mean, even you go back to the Michigan game, he had a wonderful throw down the sideline, stepping into pressure, uh, connecting with Wallace. Uh, you know, that's not a pass that Matt McGloin probably makes in college. So you can trick yourself into watching enough film to say, hey, he can make all the throws. The issue with Clifford is he, he's equally capable of not making any of the throws. So that's why I point to him probably being a step down from McGloin and definitely a couple down from McSorley. Uh, another name I wanted to talk about with you, Andrew, was uh, Brenton Strange, the tight end who, uh, you know, I think a lot of people were hopeful for for what he could bring to Penn State on the field next season, but he decided to declare for the NFL draft. Um, according to a lot of what I'm reading, he is a deep day three pick. Did he make the right decision, or do you think he could have raised his stock significantly had he stayed in Happy Valley for another year? 
It's a tough question because the issue was in Happy Valley is that the tight end room is loaded, right? I mean, you got Theo Johnson there, you got Tyler Warren, and Brenton Strange kind of is what he is at this juncture. And that's not putting him down by any means. Very good football player, loves to block, very good at that. But the speed, uh, you know, I mentioned it earlier with Jair Brown, his running ability is not the best with Brenton Strange, but his yards after catch are excellent. Um, So in terms of the production, I don't know that you really could have seen his numbers go up much more because you're sharing reps with Theo Johnson, you're sharing reps with Tyler Warren, and you got more tight ends coming into the fold now with a healthy Jerry Cross. Um, you got Khalil Dinkins, who's now a couple of years into the program. I think he made the right move for himself just from the standpoint that it was a very packed room and they were sharing a lot of reps there. And he put a lot of good stuff on tape that could show, hey, I can be an NFL guy. And I don't know that the ceiling really would have gone up that much more just based on the limitations. But he's a guy that, I mean, there's no question an NFL team is going to take him because he very much transcends to the next level in the sense that he is a block first tight end who, when he does catch the ball, very physical and can make moves after the catch. I mean, his yards after the catch is a full yard higher than uh, George Kittle in the NFL last year, which that's what he's best known for, right? It's a much smaller sample size, but um, I think you look at Strange, he's doing the right thing for himself. It's very much, again, another tough class because there's a lot of tight ends there. But if you're choosing between him and, say, Payne Durham from Purdue, who's a more prolific pass catcher and a more prolific uh, offense, teams are probably going to lean strange just because of what he does and other facets of the game that might not jump out on the stat sheet. But what he does, the pancake blocks, uh, it really does stand out. And I think in the small uh, amount of reps that he had catching the football, he showcased what he can do when he does get it. Juice Scruggs, uh, Mitchell Tinsley, P.J. Mustafer, Nick Tarburton. I think those are the other four that have a chance to get drafted. Of that group, Andrew, how many do you think um, are, are selected by the end of the draft? And um, in what order would you rank them in, in likelihood of selection? Ooh, good question. Um, I would say Scruggs is probably the most likely of them. I, I think his ability to play center and his position versatility, you know, that's a key. That's the thing that a lot of uh, NFL teams value. I'd probably put him at the top there. Um, curious to see what happens with Tinsley. I mean, not the not the biggest burner. Probably had a bit of a down season at Penn State compared to what the expectations were for him. But again, as we've mentioned, this was a run first offense, so that's probably you chalk that up to chalk that up to the diminished ability a little bit there. Um, I would say probably after Scruggs, you go Mustafer and then Tinsley and then Tarburton. I'm not forgetting anybody there, right? That's the four, or is there? Yeah, a that's fifth? The four. Yeah, so I would probably rank it in that order. Um, I'm thinking Mustafer, there's got to be a team that probably takes a flyer on him just because he hit, was coming off the injury last year. The production wasn't nearly as uh, frequent as it was in the 2021 season when he was really dominant for the first half of that season. And he's got the NFL lineage with his brother being an offensive lineman, you know, many years with the Chicago Bears. I think there's just too many reasons there for teams not to think, hey, Last year was an aberration. He was coming back from injury. It was an ACL tear. That's pretty serious for defensive linemen, especially at the tackle position. Why not take a chance on him? Uh, the issue with Tinsley is I just don't know that there's enough on tape there that warrants being a high or a selection of any kind. And with Tarburton, you could kind of say the same. Uh, you know, not the biggest body, an edge rusher who's not big enough and not quick enough. There's uh, those are kind of a dime a dozen in the NFL, and I don't know that he's the guy that you take the chance on because. The production really wasn't there. And if you looked on Penn State's roster last season, you'd probably say he was the third or fourth best pass rusher on that team. So who's to say that you put that at the NFL level that that's worth taking the taking the chance on? So we're going two out of four here, we think? Yeah, I'm thinking two out of four. I think Scruggs gets himself a sixth round or a seventh round, and somebody's got to take a flyer on Mustafer. He's sitting there. There's all these factors at play. Roll with him. I don't think so with Tinsley, and I don't think so with Tarburton. Andrew, wanted to ask you before we wrap up here about spring practice just wrapped up with a, an all-time classic blue-white game, 10 nothing. Definitely worth the price of the free admission for, for most fans. Did anything catch your eye, you know, not just in that game, but this spring um, that, that you have an eye on looking forward to, to the 2023 season, which is, you know, it's getting warm. It's going to be here before long, Andrew. Yeah, I, I think first initial thoughts are Bo Pribula is a dude. You know, I, I think it's a, no question. I know they haven't said it in the program yet. 
we all know Drew Aller is going to be the starter, barring something happening that you know would be unforeseen. This is Aller's job, right? But Bo Perville is a good athlete who showed that when he was running with the first team offense, that he could be a very capable backup. And I'm very curious to see. I mean, this has been kind of uh, alluded to, and nothing concrete has been said of it. But you go back a few years ago, Tommy Stevens, how he was used in that line package to make sure that they could get his athleticism on the field. Would not be shocked to see that somehow, some way with Bo Prevula. Uh, and this is a guy who loves Penn State. From York, this is you know where he wants to be. That could very well change in a year or two, something like that. But um, I definitely had concerns after Christian Veyer transferred to Pitt. Um, that was somebody that I thought pretty highly of as a good backup quarterback to have in the program. And I was like, who's going to step up and be the number two? Um, I think Prevula is very capable of that. Certainly a young guy as well. So, you know, they'll have to build up the experience with him there. Uh, but I think he compliments Aller pretty well and liked what I saw from him offensively, uh, liked his ability to sling the football around and, um, you know, like the receiving core too, uh, on that note. I think there's a lot of potential there and I'm curious to see when Dante Cephas finally gets on campus, how he kind of integrates himself into that group and how that kind of shakes things up because Keandre Lambert Smith, you could point to as maybe being the leader of that group right now. Uh, and, you know, I- I'm just curious to see how that all kind of shakes out. Yeah, because I think that's the group that needs to be better for Penn State to have a any serious playoff, um, let alone national championship aspirations. Is you got to get more out of the receivers than you did in twenty twenty two, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. And last year wasn't there. The year before wasn't there, and they had Jahan Dotson. It's been kind of a one man show for the last. You could go back five, six years of the James Franklin tenure. It's you got one guy and he leads the run, and everybody else kind of follows. I'm curious to see if this is a more balanced group and what they get out of. Cephas, what they get out of uh, Malik McLean, the transfer from Florida State. Curious if he develops a role, if Caden Saunders kind of takes the next step and becomes a more regular threat in the offense. It's the polarizing group. It's the one we've turned our attention to now because it seems like the offensive line has figured it out. But who's to say that can all change in four or five quick months? Absolutely. Well, Andrew, thank you for joining me today. Uh, Folks, enjoy the NFL draft. I think that it's going to be very interesting from a Penn State perspective, because as we've talked about, I think there's guys who are on the fringes of of going maybe a little bit higher than you expect them to. They could also drop, too. So I I think it's going to be a fun uh, three-day watch for Penn State fans of of where these guys land and how they're regarded in the NFL. Um, Andrew, thanks for stopping by, and, and we'll talk to you again real soon. Awesome. Thanks for having me, Adam. Take care, everyone. Thank you for checking out this content from Post Gazette Sports. If you liked the video, please like it and subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you enjoyed it on Apple Podcasts, please rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts. For six months of digital access to post-gazette.com for just $6, click the link down in the description.